I'm Don Carone, the co-writer and co-director of Different Drummers. And what you're about to watch is a story of how Different Drummers came to be a feature film. In many ways, this story begins nine years ago in 2004 when Lyle Hatcher and I formed a partnership specifically to create a screenplay and make a movie from the story. In fact, however, the story really begins back in the mid-1960s when 10-year-old Lyle was a fourth grader at Linwood Grade School on the north side of Spokane, and he met his best friend, David Dalkey, who was in a wheelchair with muscular dystrophy. You'll hear an interview with David's mother, Gloria Dalkey, who was 92 at the time the interview was conducted, in which she describes a special gift that her son David had. And it is that special gift that caused the events that took place back in the mid-1960s to stay with Lyle well into adulthood and essentially haunt him until he concluded that he needed to find a way to tell this story and to bring it to the entire world. David was such an interesting child. When he first told me that God talked to him, he was four years old. And that was when he told me that my girlfriend was going to have another little girl. I said, David, how do you know she's going to have a girl? He said, I asked God. God told me. And she did have another girl. And uh, this was kind of the beginning. I asked him once, I said, how how does God talk to you? And he looked at me like, what's the matter with you? Doesn't God talk to everybody? He said, you know, he just comes into my mind and I understand. I did a little bit of a double take, but I said, oh, that's interesting. I never ever questioned or made any comments. I just listened to this boy. So David, when God talks to you, how do you know it's God? I've never thought about it before because I've always known it since the time I was little. My son had a communication with whatever we call the Almighty. But that was all right with me. I never questioned him. I never asked him questions about it. I let whatever he had to say come freely from him. When he was um, in the third grade, um, he had a very dear teacher. Her name was Mrs. McGuire. At that time, uh, teachers did not have to accept a child in a wheelchair uh, into their classroom. And uh, Mrs. McGuire accepted David. She wanted him in her classroom. And they had a very close association. She was very ill. A great heart that he must have prayed for her. But he didn't call me and he didn't call me. And I, he generally did. And finally I opened the door and asked, David, are you all right? And he just, his little head was bowed. And I went over to him and he said, Mama, she's not going to make it. She, she's going to die. There's something I need to tell you. It's about Mrs. McGuire. Miss O'Donnell called. She wanted you to know before you go to school tomorrow. I'm very sorry, but Mrs. McGuire passed away. I need to go. Thank you for letting me swim in the pool, Mrs. Dalkey. Of course. I never said anything. I, I thought, how in the world does this child know this?
Well, there's so much about this boy that was different, and yet I tried very hard, our whole family did, for him not to be different, for him to have a life and be just one of the guys, one of the boys. And uh, I think we succeeded. Three, two, one, one blast! But 1959, and we bought the house, and it was Paul Riopel. And I told Paul, I said, okay, I said, we'll buy the house with one condition. You have to put a pool in this fall. I wanted it for therapy for David. See, that, that, was, the, uh, um, that was his main therapy, was swimming. He could swim in the pool where he couldn't walk on land. So he was confined to a wheelchair there, but in, in the pool he was free. Dina was teaching at the shallow end of the pool. She had a class in, and she was teaching uh, that class. Dennis had uh, brought him out to the pool and put him at the far end where the light is, you know, at the deep end, and he was sitting there uh, on the ledge. And David thought that he could swim down to her and surprise her. He wanted to go under the rope and, and come up behind her because he could hold his breath a long time. But something happened. He was too weak. He had been six, you see. And he grew, uh, thought he still had the strength, but he didn't. And that's when he, he went down. He was really gone. I never prayed so hard in my life, but I prayed that God would let him come to and live. I just, I passed my hand just this way over David's body, and as I passed my hand over his body, he breathed. And uh, he opened up his eyes and he looked, and he said to me, I was almost there. It was so beautiful. Then he sent me back. I was almost there. But he sent me back. Interpreted anyway. But it was something. The first time I met David was in the fourth grade. Um, I had been put in the front row, uh, primarily so the teacher could keep an eye on me. David, on the other hand, was in the front row because of his muscular dystrophy. He was in a wheelchair. So he was in the front uh, so that he could be accessible to the door. So anyway, we ended up sitting next to each other and sharing a book. And uh, that was the first time I ever met him. And David was just a quiet, easygoing guy. The teacher loved him. Uh, I didn't mind that he was the teacher's pet. Uh, maybe at that point I could actually figure out a way to use that to my advantage. Over the last 40 years, I kept going back to the places that David and I, where we had our adventures, our friendship, all the fun places and the fun things we did together, the open fields, the, the hills, the river, the school. There was something that constantly kept pushing me back in that direction. Every single time I would go back, I would remember something different, something unique, and maybe something that gave me comfort and to some degree strength, something that I was missing that I left behind. The memories of David and I have been haunting me. I need to know why. Why would something like this stay with me for 45 years? At that point, that's when I found myself hiking higher and higher and further and further than the mountains, longer periods of time. At one point I was up on a mountain and I was waiting for a storm to come in and 
Uh, I was frustrated at a point in my life, wondering what it was I was supposed to do with this story about my friend. I could see off in the distance the thunder and the lightning coming, and, and I welcomed it. At that point, as I stood there, I felt that something was speaking to me and that I was enlightened as to my purpose, I was enlightened as to my calling. The story of David and our friendship should be a movie. The first thing I needed was to get it in writing, put it on something solid, something that I could hand off. So I set up an appointment, I wrote out the initial story and was de de bound and determined. I took my checkbook and off I went. If there was anything I could do, I could certainly pay someone and uh, get the ball rolling. In deciding to put this on a, a, a CD, I made a call to the local production company, ending up uh, sitting next to him working with Don Carone, who ultimately became my co-writer and co-director on this story for the last eight and a half years. Well, I took my five-page little script that I had. Don put me into a room, handed me some headsets. Whenever you're ready. Hi, this is Lyle Hatcher, and this is my true story from grade school. It's called Different Drummers. I am yanking on my shirt, trying to get air, and wiping the sweat off of my clammy hands. Miss O'Donnell, the principal, can't stop her lip from trembling and refuses to move her hands from the folded prayer position. Her mouth is dry as she shakily sips from Must a half-empty Must have been a seed there because it wasn't too long that, that at the end of this process of putting different drummers on a DVD, Don looked at me and said, what do you intend to do with this? And I smiled, I said, well, I think it should be a movie. And he held up his hand and he pointed a finger up in the air. He said, now this is, this is the most important question. He said, is this a true story? And I said, it is. He told me right then and there, he said, this is the one, this is the one I've been waiting for. Well, when someone like that talks to you and tells you that, that's a strong message. It was the next day that Don showed up at my office and had a contract in his hand. And uh, eventually it came down to not a signed contract I had believed him to be a man of his word, which is rare in these times. I reached across my desk and I shook his hand and that was our friendship and our partnership all in one moment, right there. Uh, I don't think either one of us knew that we were about ready to sacrifice all those years and of course every penny we had, including our retirement accounts, in order to move something that uh, the only thing we knew is our hearts and minds said this is something we had to do. Once we had decided to write the screenplay, uh, I, Don and I got together one morning and I drove him around to all the places where David and I uh, hung out. We went to the fish hatchery, we went to our old grade school, uh, went to the, all the places in the screenplay and in the movie. I ended up at about 10 o'clock on a Monday morning, I ended up in front of uh, David Dalkey's old house uh, where he lived back in 1965. Knocked on the door and a little white-haired, beautiful, elderly woman answered the door. There she was, Gloria Dalkey, David's mother, and I said, I'm Lyle. I started to say my last name, and she said, I know who you are. I've been waiting for you. She said, if you guys are going to do this, you're going to need some things. So she invited Don and I to go down into the basement. Now that basement uh, was where David and I used to play, and there were all kinds of incredible things. His brother was a taxidermist, and it was just an amazing place. I walked downstairs and nothing had changed in 40 plus years. It was still the same. Gloria Dalkey, David's mother, walked across the room and there was a big chest. And she opened it up and inside that were all the things that David and I had as friends. 
my phone number, uh, a letter from my brother who was eight years old at the time when David was not feeling well. There were some of the toys and some of his clothes. Um, we actually filmed all the events that happened 40 years earlier in that same house, in the same basement, in the swimming pool, in his own room. Don and I were working late one night. It was uh, We were working in his little house that he was selling at the time in order to keep our process moving. And uh, he received a phone call. At the end of the phone call, uh, I asked him, I said, who was that? And he said, oh, it's, uh, it's the Houston Film Festival. They wanted to know if we were coming to their festival. So I called him back and they, they encouraged us. They said, we'd really encourage you to come. Now, Houston International Film Festival is one of the oldest film festivals in the country. I wanted to go. I wanted the adventure. There must be a reason they're inviting us. We got to Houston and it's a very long process. It, uh, it starts at eight and ends at midnight. By the time it had gotten to midnight, everybody at our tables and everybody around us had their awards. I was feeling like I uh, somehow had n screwed up the dates or the times and that we shouldn't be there. Don and I went to the uh, front desk and I asked him, I said, hi, I'm Lyle Hatcher and I'm here to ask about different drummers. And the young lady that uh, was, was in charge smiled at me and she said, sir, I strongly advise that you go sit down. We went back, we sat down and the last award, which was the Grand Remington, the number one project over the thousands of projects over 32 countries, was awarded right then to different drummers. That was a big piece of us waking up the next day and saying, we must be doing something right. We must be on the right path. Let's keep going. When I first met Lyle Hatcher back in the fall of 2004 when he came into my office at North by Northwest in order to record a story that he had written onto a CD. And in the process of recording this story, I realized I was listening to what was clearly the best idea I had ever heard for a movie. What struck me about this story was it had the type of characters and the type of diversity and the type of character arcs that you would struggle to come up with in writing fiction. And it was all built in, it was all true, it was all already there. It didn't have a screenplay structure to it naturally, but I felt that was something that we could easily accomplish. And so within 48 hours, uh, Lyle and I had formed a business partnership and had begun work on the screenplay for different drummers. By January of the following year, I had quit my job at North by Northwest in order to devote myself full time to writing the screenplay. And about a year later, we won the uh, Grand Remington from the Houston World Fest International Film Festival and Best Screenplay from the San Fernando International Film Festival. Those awards at the time seemed to us to be a stamp of credibility and not just to the degree that we were on the right path, that certainly, but also it gave us the confidence to begin to move forward with the process of finding the funding in order to turn the screenplay into a feature film. The approach that we took, because we did have some resources at that point in time, was we hired Derek Cavanaugh, who was the producer for Dances with Wolves, in order to put, put together a budget for us and a time schedule. And we also hired casting director Mike Finton, who was the casting director for The Godfather and uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Back to the Future. And he put together a list of potential actors for us. Our goal was to uh, do an investor presentation where we would invite all the individuals from Spokane who we thought 
had the means or the interest in investing in a movie. Well, Gary and Lisa Marks had been on board and big supporters of this project from the time we started it, and they ultimately became our executive producers. However, we did not get a single additional investor from, from our uh, presentation. Uh, Gary and Lyle continued over the next year to leave no stone unturned looking for people who might be interested in investing, but really nothing turned up. And so at that point, we decided it might be effective as a tool to have a book instead of a screenplay. We felt that if we wrote a book, the emotional power of the story would be more apparent and it would be a better tool for finding investors. Initially, we had conducted interviews with all of the individuals that we could find that were still alive when those events happened. Anyone uh, that had somehow touched on those events that were in our story, we would interview them. Deciding to write the book meant going back to square one, and we did the interviews again in more detail. So by 2010, we had finished the book, and it almost immediately became a local bestseller at Barnes & Noble and Auntie's. We spent that following year doing book signings and handing out books to potential investors and just spreading the message about the story and our intent to make it into a movie just everywhere we could. And yet, even with all that effort, we still did not find another investor. At that point, I had spent my IRA and I had sold my house to live on the money while we were moving the project forward. We had hit rock bottom in our business venture. We had reached a point where we hadn't seen a lead or even a second generation lead for months and months. And I remember in my conversation with Lyle, we had to have a pretty serious heart to heart about it because I was stepping aside and I even offered to sell him uh, my shares in the, in the movie, which thankfully he declined. So I started an internet marketing business and, and put my focus into that. And it was several months later when I got a surprise visit from Mark Dahlstrom, a local producer. And Lyle had approached Mark uh, to brainstorm the possibilities of one last try at moving this project forward and getting this movie made. And Mark was clearly intent on doing that when he contacted me. And his first question was, what would it take to get this book adapted back into an updated screenplay? So I went to work on that in, in late 2011 and finished it in the spring of 2012. So we now had a completed production screenplay uh, based on the, the updated version of the story that, that had been represented in the book. And we had some additional funding. And I got a call from Mark in August, and he said, we're going we're gonna to move ahead with the movie. What I saw was that there was three enormous potential obstacles to success with this movie. One was weather. We all know how the weather is in the Northwest. And I just had visions of this outdoor movie being just inundated with snow, and I really wasn't seeing a way to write our way out of that, uh, given the, the story that we were dealing with. There was also the issue of the time limitation in starting pre-production so soon, we didn't have any leads on the two main actors of the movie, the two boys, and we all agreed, and we always had, that if we didn't have the right two boys, we couldn't make the movie. And lastly, we didn't have all the money. We're sitting in that meeting. I'm voicing my objections. Mark Dahlstrom is, is the polar opposite of myself on this position. He's just utterly optimistic that it's all going to work. Gary's concerned that if we don't make the move right now, that the new investors that we've brought on are not going to wait. And Lyle agrees with Gary. So the three of them are ready to move forward on the movie. So we decided right then and there, let's do it. Let's make this movie.
Dancer boy, why don't you hoochie coochie with that for a while? Mark it. Mark. All right, set. Action. I've got muscular dystrophy. How come they make you run all the time? I got this thing. It's kind of a problem. Dino, go get help! Can you feel the energy? <laughs> Big smiles! <laughs> Mr. Hatcher. Oh, yeah. Just stop it! <laughs> What's it for, anyways? It's my urinal tube. What's going on? We'll talk about the science fair. You want to help me? My old man said I can't ever do another one with you. I was thinking, you and me, we can do a giant bug clashing. I've got a super secret weapon. You do? Black Widow! I'm gonna lose. Ah, look out, look out! Here! Oh, yuck. You can't tell anyone I'm teaching you how to run. But you can't tell anyone my secret either. When God talks to you, how do you know it's God? He just comes into my head and I know the answer. Hey, David, let's go sledding. Pull the brakes, David! How badly was the donkey boy hurt? I'm sorry, David. Why am I always getting in trouble? What's wrong with me? Nothing at all. A drug? It's been a very successful way to mainstream problem children. You're awfully quiet today. I take a pill now, because I was driving everybody crazy. Have you seen Lyle? I thought he was with you. I guess I fell asleep. What are you doing to that boy? It's not right, and you know it. I want my son back. 
he will no longer remain in my school. Let's run! <laughs> Friends, don't bail. A boy needs to be a boy. I need to figure out a way to help David. He's getting worse. Sometimes all you can do is be the best friend that you can be. Don't forget me. The next time you talk to God, ask him if you'll ever run again. I did ask God about that. What did he say? He told me I would. With you.